This is Dr. Phil Chavez of the Men's Academy. Brothers, if you're like the average man, you're struggling with work, with your wife, with your kids, and like most men, you're looking for a spiritual life to move past your faults and fears and to help you find strength and peace. At the Men's Academy, we help all men become grounded in Catholic manhood, to become anchored as a beloved son and fulfilled as a strong patriarch, the way you were designed by your creator to live. Now specifically, we support you as a leader, a protector, and a provider, and help you thrive in your supernatural calling as a priest, a prophet, and a king. Brothers, welcome to the Beloved Son podcast, where we explore what it is for a Catholic layman to live in the identity of Jesus Christ and to walk in his journey. This is Dr. Phil Chavez, and I'm again joined by Chuck Harvey. And we will dive, as always, profoundly and deeply into how we can move and roll in Christ as beloved Son of God and perfect ourselves and everything about the journey of Jesus Christ. And before we begin, as usual, let's start with a prayer. need the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Holy Father, we just, again, place ourselves in your holy hands. We just want to be your sons. We want to give you glory. We want to always live for your great name. Father, show us that journey of what it means to do that. Show what it means to live as your beloved son in good times and in bad, in sickness and in health, in sorrow and in joy. Father, teach us also to surrender to you as Father in everything that that means. Father, we ask all these things for intercession of all the angels and all the saints, and ask all these things for your Son, our Lord, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. All right, Chuck, where would you like to pick off from here? Well, I was thinking, you know, in our last uh, episode, we at one point we got we were talking about sort of our common, uh, you know, sort of parentage, to, you know, back to uh, Adam and Eve in the garden, and and the whole idea of being brothers and sisters, and it, and it got me thinking about, you know, you know, before the fall, right, uh, we were in complete harmony with God as our Father, with with one another, you know, men and women were in harmony uh, with creature with. With creation and also uh, within ourselves. So I, I was wondering, we've talked a little bit about, we've talked a lot about us in relation to the Father. We've talked about us in relation to one another. Uh, what about uh, within ourselves? In other words, um, mm. how does um, walking as a beloved son help to, I guess the best word, to to reintegrate our, within ourselves, to, to sort of, yeah, to integrate ourselves as, as a as person? Yeah, that's a good question. You know, it's interesting. I think one of the things that um, that keeps men from maybe realizing any profound truth or even sometimes even some of the clear truths is, is their fear, right? And so now fear is kind of a, it's a strange word only in the sense that I believe it has many different, we could speak, use different terms even for the word fear. But the, also, I think there's many types types of fears within men. You know, like the fear of the unknown, um, the fear of what to do next, the fear of, um, yeah, what may be around the corner, the fear on how to accomplish something, the fear on whether our, our future will turn out in some kind of harmonious way. And so I think what happens is, the interior harmony, I think, comes first out the gate when we're free from fear. I mean, I have to think even more deeply because I'm sure there's other things, but that's definitely the first thing that comes to mind. And so, as St. Paul says, perfect love casts out all fear. And the only, the only people that are really truly free are not people who um, are able to accomplish and have all of these kinds of goods, but the people who are they're truly free interiorly. They're, they're free from fear. And the only thing that gets them there really is, is knowing that they are in some way loved because love casts out fear. And I think what happens is too, you know, men, I think, have a hard time, women for different reasons, but men have a hard time like uh, receiving that love of the God. In fact, first realizing that identity and understanding that they're, they're, they're worthy because of an identity, because of the beloved son. And so... Every man in the face of his father, you know, wants to know that he's worthy. Um, and it's that love that really, well, he has his love just in the nature of being a son. But when he realizes that, then he's able to receive the father's love and grow into even deeper levels of overcoming fear. Because I think that's right, too, is that, 
you know, fear comes, there's lesser fears and there's greater fears. And I think the Christian is supposed to come overcome, know how to overcome the worst of fears, which I guess is our manner of death and suffering and all the rest. So it's God's, it's God's love that helps us cut through, I think, even that, that deep fear. And therefore we could be interiorly free. Yeah, I'm wondering when you're when you're saying that is is it's going to apply to women too, but I think uh, I think it's applying to women more as they get out into the work world and, and, and focus on career. But for men, it's almost like uh, would it be would it be accurate to say our 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 careerism, right? We get obsessed with our career. It's almost that's that's our labor becoming a toil, right? In other words, mm. when we when we when we don't operate as beloved sons, we're, we're seeking. Um, fulfillment out of our jobs or our career or our success and we actually become enslaved in our in our and our labor instead of our labor being a labor of joy that's that's um bringing glory to god our labor becomes something we keep grasping at and becomes a chore and becomes suffering is that yeah because it never stops or there's never some fine there's never some end to our labor right <clears throat> and so this is why men will keep seeking one of the reasons now i think men need to kind of there's there's something about men too that i think there always needs to be a conquest right mm -hmm. and to reach for something greater i think that's just in the natural order however sometimes the motivation between growing in that conquest or you know subduing the earth let's say if if one's not motivated uh by love then they, yeah one's going to so hyper focus on that that conquest becomes the be all and end all I know this. I know this couple uh, where this man he um, he actually he builds golf courses and he does well for himself and um, he's well advanced in years and he's got this let's just say this very elaborate plan to build a lot of houses around a new golf course he's designing right right and he's. He's up there in years and he doesn't need any money and um, definitely doesn't need that. And um, he's more than comfortable. But yet he's, he's again, he's, he's advancing years, but he, it's another project that he just wants to see get done, you know? And um, I have a certain fondness for him. And uh, his wife says, Gee, why does he, why does he need something more? She just doesn't get it, you know? And it's true. I think there's something that drives us men to always want that next project. But that, but if that if that next project is never not done, when one has already received love from God, then I don't know. The projects sometimes they're filled out of emptiness because once the project's done, then there's emptiness, and it's about the next project. Right. Right. <clears throat> this is why a lot of times men are just not very satisfied. It's kind of with the self-help, you know, you could help me with this too, because I'm sure you know more about this than I would, you know, in the, in the, in the self-help space where you get these entrepreneurial speakers who are sharp, many of them, and have good things to say, and they're very bright. And when people get caught up into the self-help space where they so learn about the next greatest technique to make money and to move forward and right. how to manage and, and all the rest. It's almost like that's a never ending, it's a never ending trail. And so a lot of these self-help people, they get these followers who would just keep signing on for the next program. Oh, yeah. Because if they're not satisfied, if it's all about their work, then they'll never be satisfied. It's always about, oh, what's the next technique I need to learn? What's the next breakthrough I need to have? What's the next um, how-to strategy that I need to implement? And so, you know, and they're, they're, they often think, too, that or they're often kind of told, well, yeah, and you got to know kind of the latest trends, and we'll tell you what all those are about, you know, and you'll get information for us on all of our background research. We've done it all for you. Right. So we're going right. to show you how to really make it amongst this this new growing or advancing world, you know. And and I find that, you know, in some way, and a lot of these, you know, people are dropping big dollars for some of these programs. And you've got to be successful to keep dropping these big dollars. I mean, you'll get some novices in the beginning. And they'll drop out if they're not making money. But those those people making money and advancing will continue to pay that. 
and I wonder too if sometimes that's motivated out of fear, mm -hmm. and and because they're they're not they're not satisfied because it, deep down they don't feel like they're loved, and so the conquest is reinforced by their need to keep accomplishing, and so they'll keep buying into a lot of these self help gurus, who again I think I've, I've heard of some of them, and the some of them are kind of brilliant, but but some lean on them a little bit too heavily to find this, you know, to keep up this nirvana of the happy life and the successful life and all the rest. Right. Well, it's funny. It's a, it's a little bit of an aside, but I, you know, I teach uh, a business class too, besides my theology mm. classes. And I, I was telling my business students that, and I'm a little cynical around this, but I said, I said, you know, really there are very few new ideas. It's mm. just that consultants come along and they repackage them. They call them something else. They, they publish a new book and they just resell the same stuff mm. <laughs> over and over again. And, but, but I think, I think to your point they're they're tapping into a human, uh, perhaps a fallen human nature that we, yeah, we're always looking for the, for the trick or we're always looking for, or we always feel like we need the latest and greatest new idea that no one else has ever thought of. Um, yeah. When and really yeah. like, you know, life, even in, you know, business has certain basic, basic rules and basic operations of just practical reason, right? Yeah. yeah. That you don't, that you don't, you don't necessarily need tricks, but yeah. And isn't it the case that if they're not happy within themselves, that that means, Hey, I really haven't learned the new tricks or techniques, or I haven't really learned how to practice what I already know into this new world, into this growing, changing business world. And right. so it never stops with the need to find out, yeah, that latest or allegedly or apparently latest technique or latest like breakthrough or, right. or that missing, that missing link that gosh, once they get that, wow, that that's gonna you bring us some certain happiness. Yeah. So a lot of people I think will, will do a lot of different things, pursue a lot of things in some kind of vain quest for happiness. I mean, it's all, in, it's a natural quest we all want to walk in. Yeah, the question is, what's health really look like when we're walking in that quest? And so if we don't, if we don't feel loved, then, and, and find a goodness and being loved and a happiness and securing a peace there, it's going to always be by what we do. And what we do will always lead us in fear. Right. Now, some men, it's interesting, you correct me on this because, and you've probably seen this more in your business experience. I, I, it's interesting how, I remember one man confessing to me, a very successful man in the business world, that he still was living in fear, you know, and he had no reason to based certainly upon what he was owned, how successful he was. There was no fear, but he still said he was, he was living in fear. And I, I wonder too, if sometimes even the most confident men have kind of secondary fears. Oh, I, I, absolutely. I mean, um, yeah, I can, I can, two, two things from a personal perspective. So, you know, as you know, in the past, you and I have gone to several retreats uh, together. And I, I, I tell people, you know, I tell the boys that I'm teaching, you know, one of the greatest things about those retreats was, was that first night, you know, all the guys show up and everybody's sizing each other up. And that guy's a doctor, <laughs> and that, that guy's a lawyer, and uh, I'm this, oh, and I own yeah. a company and all this stuff, you know? Yeah. And, and then after the first night and that first campfire, we're all crying little boys, right? Because we're all afraid. Everybody's afraid. Everybody, right. Everybody, all these successful people, and, and, they, and they are successful. They're not like, yeah, they're not, they're not posers. They, they, these are truly su successful people in terms of where the world measures it, but they're all living in fear. They, they feel that somehow they're not loved. They're inadequate. They're, they're, they're going to be found out. Mm. Now I, I found that again refreshing to know. Oh, okay, I'm not the only one who's walking around in my head thinking that you know these things. But to your point, I think you know the answer to that is when when you begin to realize that you are loved by God and a beloved son of God, then some of those fears subside because you're not chasing after uh, this ever receding goal of of success or, or collecting trophies or whatever that is it, it, you never get there right yeah and probably we are se secretly seeking what are we seeking affirmation and love and and to be 
to be worthy. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, I think that's where that's where God comes in, right? That's where we're being a beloved son. And, and the other, the other thing I was going to say from a personal standpoint, that's that's kind of where I was. You know, actually, this is ten years. It's ten years this year since I I quit my corporate life, mm. and I should have quit my corporate life much earlier. And the mm. and the and the reason I didn't was pure fear. Interesting, yeah. unfounded, illogical fear. I, I can remember ten years ago, just convinced that if I quit my job, mm-hmm. my wife will leave me, my kids will hate me, mm-hmm. I won't have a house, I'll be living on the streets, and that, uh-huh. and that was absolutely, objectively not true, uh-huh. given my real circumstances. But in my head, and I'm, I don't think I'm unique in that. Wow. Yeah, I'm not even sure how, what even more to say on that. I know I have some in the back of my head here. I was going to say, but I kind of lost it there. But um, well, no, because I, I was saying that's what that's what you were suggesting. Uh, you were you were saying that you think that uh, you were saying that some people seem to um, irrationally think that they they live in this fear, even though they're actually in good uh, circumstances, they financial circumstances. Yeah. But isn't isn't true. isn't one of the difficulties too? Is that one of the one of the things that makes being a man very difficult? Is, and I think this is where men have conflict with their wives is they move in and want. There's a part of them that moves in a different mode. In other words, we're supposed to move in relationship, and we're supposed to move in objective. Now, relationship is higher. Got it. But we still have to move in objective. There are things that still need to be accomplished. There are still things need to be done. And it's incumbent upon men, too, to seek per- perfection in whatever they're doing. I didn't say hyper-perfection, but it's in the order of nature to try to keep improving what we're doing to help subdue the earth, right? Which is our calling. Right, right. But at the same time, to try to maintain a level of relationship. And this is where... You know why it's one reason it's hard for the rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven because the rich man has to be very much engaged if he's rich and usually stay rich or if he's rich, you know, as as Plato says, he's a slave to his possessions and he's a slave to whatever he established to keep going in a sense Um, that he's got to he's got to have a certain focus there that can take him away from the pursuit of God. But right. it's necessary he keep that focus, or let, I didn't say primal focus, but keep his focus on all those things he needs to maintain. And I know for some men that really weighs them down, and it, minimum case scenario, it, it so easily distracts them from leading a life of relationship. And I know some men like this who do well in the business world, but... And I've heard the teachings on the beloved son kind of ad nauseum for me and well, for me. <laughs> and so they can't, they can't really, it's hard for them to embrace when they have so much to take other like custody of and other things. And I think this is something that kind of women don't understand is because now things may have changed a little bit in, in later years with women in the workforce and in, in enterprise, but you know, I think women, for the most part, they can navigate in a relationship and they have this sort of this genius to serve based upon relationship. So their navigational device in relationship is never really lost or traditionally is never really lost or inherently in their, their being doesn't have to be lost. <clears throat> I think it is for many today. But but my point is to say that men, what's hard and what I don't think wives really understand is that you know, when God, you know, we can we can maybe learn what it is to be a relationship. There's a part of us that has to almost extricate ourselves in a way from that, at least for a time or in a certain moment we're at work because we got to achieve those goals. we got to focus on taking that hill, getting that skyscraper up and rolling, you know, or whatever it is. And I think sometimes this is what separates kind of the love between men and women because sometimes if women see – that the objectives he's trying to reach seem to like take him away from that relationship mode. Sometimes I think some get a little, little nervous about that. So, so what does, what does that look like then? And I guess when I say the, what, what does it, 
What does it look like to be a beloved son provider as opposed to a provider who doesn't realize they're a beloved son? Like if, if a man's watching that, like wants to sort of look in the mirror, what, what are some signs that you are, you may be a good provider, but you're, but you're, you're not providing, you're not moving as a beloved son while you're doing it. And therefore you might be uh, on, the, on, a, on a bad path. Yeah, there's, um, I believe there's a cognition that we're all supposed, all Christian men are to develop. That they're always moving in God. Now, in other words, that there's something about the way they live and move and sustain their own being, a man that is, by which he's always aware he's moving in relationship with God his heavenly father. In other words, that awareness never leaves him. Versus I think he could have a, and, and so he needs to work out everything he does with that awareness. And so you can have a Christian man who, well, they understand the truth, but they don't navigate out of it. They still almost kind of extricate themselves out of their, not Christian identity, but Christian mode and start moving in a business mode without that awareness. And I think that happens very often. Now the question and, is, so what do they do? So I, I don't know when you when you interact with men, what, what is it that uh, these? There are certain signs that uh, certain th things that a man might say to you. You might say, mm, "Listen, brother, I think you, you might you might you might be a little bit off kilter here. You're you're chasing after the you're you're filling up the barns. And you're not you're not providing for your family spiritually. You're just filling up barns. And you're chasing after." Yeah. <clears throat> to answer that question, this may sound kind of presumptuous, almost judgmental, but, you know, for a man who's moving as a beloved son, is it just the knowledge of that? He's actually living in it and he's taking the time to spend time with his heavenly father. And so, you know, again, as the, ch the teachers in the church say, try to spend Saints of the church have said, fathers of the church, try to spend their rough estimate is like a half hour of intimate prayer every day. Now, if one is doing that, that will have an effect on one's life and help in that navigation. Now, for those who will frequently do that and may have made that an habitual part of their life, it's not hard for them to see others as if they're moving that communion or not. In other words, that awareness, that navigation of moving communion, I believe can only really, I won't say only, but for the most part, really only happens. I don't like speaking such absolutes, but only really happens to those who are spending that concerted time every day to be in communion. And so what happens is, it seems to me, one who moves in that communion, you know, as, as Aristotle says in the physics, like knows like. For those who move in that communion, they just somehow know others who also move in that communion. In fact, you can kind of see it in others. Mm -hmm. You can actually look into somebody's eyes and know if he moves in that communion. You can somewhat hear of a priest's homilies and know in some way, well, to a greater less degree, if he's moving in a communion. Um, and so I, I think that's the way it's seen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so these are some dots I've connected recently. And if, if we're going too far off out of the lanes, pulling back in, but um, I don't know how familiar you are with, with the writings of like uh, Dorothy Day and Peter Marin and the, Old Catholic workers movement, but not very much. But I've read some of Dorothy Day's things. But you know, if I if I can kind of if I can connect the dots between what you've been saying and what what they would say, it's almost like I think they would say in order to be a beloved son of God and to know your beloved son of God, you have to embrace poverty. Now, when mm -hmm. they say embrace poverty, they don't mean embrace destitution. Yeah, they, but you know, embrace poverty in the sense of. Um, uh, not chasing after more than you need and, 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 and giving yourself over surrendering to God's providence. Okay. And so 
Now, when I read that stuff, I found it very convicting. Yeah. However, and when I shared it with some fellow men, they, they had the same reaction. It's almost like, yeah, if I were by myself and I were single, maybe I could do that. But I'm responsible for other yeah. people. I'm responsible for my wife and my kids. And then it, and what ends up happening is, okay, am I using my wife and kids as an excuse to not do what God wants me to do as a beloved son? Or is it legitimate to say, no, I, I can't, as a, as a provider, I can't volunteer my family into poverty. Um, and I can see the argument as well, if they're going to learn to be beloved sons themselves and be disciples of Christ, you, you want them to, <laughs> to develop that discipleship. So I, I what would you say that I think men str- I think men struggle with that in the sense of like when am I being a good provider and when am I being selfish or I'm using my provider sh- my provider role as an excuse to fill my barns. Mm. Well, you know when you say that, two <laughs> things come to mind. First of all, um, two things I'd like to bring up, which I think address the problem, maybe not as directly as you want it. First of all, the reality is it is harder for a married man with kids, especially with growing kids with growing needs to surrender to that life of poverty, to that kind of abandonment, right? It just is because there is contingent So on that level, he does have to act on a deeper level of faith, no question. And that's, that's not easy. And so, I'm, uh, yeah, so I sympathize with that. But I wonder if there's a deeper navigation here because you remind me, I did read, and I think it was Dorothy Day, she she is brilliant, by the way. I mean, of the things that I've, I've read from her, the clips that were carefully excerpted from her, because I've, I've never read like a book or long work that she's done, but I've just seen excerpts. I remember her going through a reflection of the Holy Family, and she said something in extent, she, and I'm paraphrasing her, she says, if we are not willing, if a Christian is not willing to accept that same poverty, that Joseph and Mary accepted, freely accepted. We are not worthy to call ourselves Christian. Mm -hmm. Now, I think what happens, it's a good challenge because sometimes when it comes to navigation, maybe we do need to be pointed out to those ideals to try to be aspired for um, in order to embrace some kind of abandonment and abandoned in poverty. So if we're never, cha- say, if we're never challenged to that, because that made me think, I thought, wow, that's pretty heavy. You know, if we're not willing to like freely accept the poverty of Joseph and Mary, we can't really deserve to be called Christians. I kind of meant when I read that, that really got me thinking. I mean, that's pretty heavy when you think mm-hmm. about it. Mm-hmm. And so, and I'm pretty sure that was Dorothy Day I read it from. Now, now that what's what's neat about a statement like that is that should be instructive for Catholics, maybe just Catholic men and women, but as we're talking about now, Catholic fathers with growing kids and whatnot, with, like we say, with growing needs. If they can kind of see that as some kind of a deal to be reached, or something to embrace, or something to aspire for, or something that makes actual sense, it gives them a navigational device, or it gives them a navigational goal, or some kind of ideal by which if they can. If they can believe that that's a true ideal and try to, you know, Father, I just, let me aspire to this. Or, Father, lead me on this journey toward becoming something like this. You know, if, they, if their heart is open to, like, embracing that, even if they don't really embrace it now, um, I think that's a good kind of foundation for them to accept what it is to lead their families and their kids with the impending possibility of poverty. And to keep them out of fear of it. Because I think, isn't that why God the Father ordained that Joseph and Mary live such a poor life for us not to be in fear of that? Right. Yeah, so that that really takes a lot of, I'd say, a lot of faith and a lot of trust. Yeah, and I think I think that's kind of what her point was. And I, I again I, I can I can relate this to my lived experience that, that what ends up happening is yes, the, the fear when you when you can't embrace poverty, you begin to fear it, and and the fear of poverty is enslaving. It just 
and I, and I think it's especially difficult in our culture. You know, in our our culture is like the opposite of that, right? Our yeah. culture is the credit card culture. Just just everybody buying toys and uh, don't worry about the debt. Um, so it's very difficult, and it's it's very difficult. I think in our society to not um, develop this sort of fear of poverty, yeah. which is which takes you, I think, away from God. Yeah. Because you're you're relying on yourself and you're relying on yeah. uh, your economic power as opposed to no, I, I'm 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 a son of God. He loves me and I'm and I'm turning myself over. That doesn't mean we don't accomplish things and we don't try to to uh, to be stewards of the world, but we start to rely on ourselves and not on God, and we start to we start to not trust God because God's not putting money in our, enough money in our bank account and yeah. um it's, yeah, a, str- and it's is- a struggle. Yeah, and this is why to move out of that struggle, it's otherwise, I would say, like impossible or morally impossible if we don't reflect on the poverty of Mary and Joseph and don't reflect on the poverty of Jesus himself. You know, who, or even for that matter, even like the disciples or something, you know, I mean, they went off in foreign distant lands, you know, and I don't know to what extent they carried property or, or, uh, you know, they didn't have credit cards or, you know, they couldn't use the, their well, app. we know when he, when he first sent them out two by two, it was like, don't bring anything with you. Right. Don't bring- <laughs> yeah, very good. Just go. Yeah, and that's powerful. No extra tunic. Yeah. What do you say? A no money belt, no um, money belt, no extra tunic. Just yeah. Zowie. Yeah. And I think even Mother Teresa, doesn't she, when she tests out her novices or tertiaries or, you know, post novice or whatever, um, that they literally dump them off at some place. I mean, a city, you know, with people right. in the middle of the desert, but they, they, they drop them off in the middle of the city and good luck, you know. <laughs> and so they have to learn a certain dependence on those around them. And, um, learn a radical trust you know i mean there's some religious orders even the dominicans i think at one point their first their founding you know they were only allowed to eat what they begged for right in fact i don't want to go too far afield but i think this is what's hurting some of the religious orders today is that certain practices of of these poverty, these acts of poverty aren't being followed, and I think compromise the integrity of the order. But, but yeah, I mean, it's interesting how even you, you know, in my studies of the saints in Rome, I kind of realized, wow, when you you look in their lives, um, every one of them worked with the poor. I mean, every one of them, and I think what happened was. In days of earlier Christianity, I mean, I'm, I'm only talking like pre, everything pre 19th century. It seemed like maybe pre 20th century, it seemed like all holy people worked with the poor. And maybe there was a certain awareness amongst them that to lead an integrated Christian life, especially if you were like, um, you know, took holy orders or were or took religious vows, that there was some constitutive about serving the poor that would kind of help you navigate rightly. Um, and to be extricated from that, especially for religious, I don't think is a good thing. Um, yeah, so, so religious orders versus, say, Das and priesthood, you know, they incorporated uh, practices of poverty that was real, real denial. Right. And um, this is one of the reasons why I think, like, St. Francis led really the greatest religious movement ever in the world and um there's more franciscans of any other religious order because there is something constitute about the christian life whether you live in poverty or not you're surrendered to it right. and the franciscans were always or at least in their spirituality which poverty is their number one deal right and they're they're surrendered to that and i think what happened was they gained a lot of followers when the followers saw the freedom in these people in that they were actually very attractive because they had the freedom from worldly possessions and that attracted them to others. And so that's even to be said of Francis and his initial followers who, 
you know, their habits weren't these custom tailored outfits with right. well done wool. I mean, they were they were rough, it, and I think they were kind of a one size fits all, or virtually right. And so, and you know, I imagine you know they they wore crude shoes and kind of. I don't I don't know if their hair was well kept. I don't know, but I mean, certainly their appearance from their clothing and their shoes it was it was it was anything but attractive yet people were greatly attracted to them because of maybe their message has flew, flowed from who they are and so those people who 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 are surrendered to poverty i think just the history of church shows they were very they, they were they were they drew others to them because of that right. spirit through which they were able to foster and grow in right so let me ask you, I know that, you know, I think from our past discussions, I mean, you've always been a faithful follower of Christ, but I believe that the, the realization about being a beloved son came along at some point. Yeah. Um, do, do you, do you, can you, can you um, picture, was there a difference in, in, in your sense of fear before, or af, uh, yeah, after that, after that realization about being a beloved son than before? Did you, yeah. You know, what's interesting Okay, yeah, but one of the things I've learned about being a beloved son, it's important not to look at where you are at, but where God is. In other words, and maybe this is what it, I kind of learned what it is to be a beloved son, because sometimes when you embrace that, you think, you know, part of, okay, part of what, what what's harmful in men generally is that, and we already talked about this earlier is that with men we'll kind of always assess ourselves and where we're at right mm -hmm. and um what's important and it's true we need to be outside of fear but it's not so much about the dispositions of where we're at it's got to be more about well i'll use the word the dispositions of where god's at and so what happens is a beloved son he needs to not, he could be a greater or less degree in internal freedom about where he's at. Now, I think the journey will keep him more and more free. But a beloved son, which defines him more, is not about whatever he believes where he's at, but where he believes the father's at. And so it's so important when a man look at himself as a beloved son, they look at himself like, gosh, Look at the level of freedom I've received now that I've got this father who loves me and I'm able to walk in that love. Now, that should free him to some extent, but he needs to see that, see, what because the, the, the father will leave his beloved son always needy. And this is kind of the paradox that, that even I'm trying to stir out my own life because he always leaves me very needy in my journey. And that needs on different levels, okay? But he always is, is gifting to me is to actually always leave me in a deep need. Why? Why? Because he never wants to, me to let go of where he's at, that he's always providing for. That what does St. Thomas say? That, yes, our being is preserved, our life is governed, and our activity is directed by him. So the beloved son sees more of where God is at and not where he's at. As a friend of mine sometimes says, it's not when we look at ourselves in the spiritual life, he says, it's not what we're going through. It's what Jesus went through. And we see what Jesus went through in light of how his father provided for him. We've got to see this journey really is outside of ourselves. Because the beloved son, what he needs to happen to him, he has to stop looking at himself. And he's got to focus on God. Or that he's what he's got to do, he's got to make, he's got to make his recourse always to God in some primal way before looking at himself. So if he sees a problem to be worked out say he really is stuck, I don't know, with paying the rent or um, he's stranded out in the middle of the desert or he's uh, he's just sprained his foot and he's out on a hike three miles away. The beloved son, what happens in him 
is that he has an automatic, an autopilot, or should have an autopilot, which sees his recourse to his father first. Mm -hmm. Not where he's at, but where his father is. And that paradox, and I, I, I'm trying to understand in my life to explain to Lehman, I don't know how to. But you see his beloved son, he leaves in more need. But when you say more need, do you, you don't do you mean more sense of fear or just more well, need? In some in some sense of like, okay, I don't even know how to describe that. But because here's well, how here's how I was hearing you say it and, and how I how I of course I'm I'm not you but when but when you when I relate when I hear you talk about kind of your experience of it, it sounds like um. I continue to have needs. I continue to have unanswered questions or things might happen and I'm not sure what's going to happen, but I'm, but I'm less and less in fear of that because yeah. I, I trust my father. So my, so my fear, my actual uh, crippling anxiety producing fear is actually going down, even though it's not that my problems have gone away. It's not that objectively there aren't still things that I don't have the answer to, or I don't have the money for or whatever, but, but instead of, this fear of what might happen if it doesn't turn out some way that that goes away and it's replaced by, you know, God, I, God, I know that you got this, you got this and I know yeah. you're taking care of me and I don't understand it all. Is that? Yeah. And the paradox is like I said, which is not good to tell beginners is that God makes life tougher. Right. The beloved son. We want to think, Oh, I become a beloved son. Experience the love of God. Right. Cool. Now I'm I get the start. car. I get the keys of the car. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna get the keys of the car, and it's gonna be full with gas, and all is just gonna go really well in all of my circumstances. What I'm hesitate, like I say, to tell guys who are just kind of walking this journey, you gotta be very careful because the reality is, it becomes more difficult. Mm -hmm. I love that passage. Where is it? I, I should have it memorized and ingrained, almost tattooed on me, which I think is the only justification for tattoos if they're scripture passages we really need to know. Is that is, is that, where's that passage? Is in Ephesians, he scourges everyone he loves. He chastises every son he receives. Because when he loves you, when he loves your son, when he loves his son, he wants him, his son to grow in what's really worth growing in, and that's like heroic virtue and that heroic virtue of faith and trust, you know, and faith, hope, and charity, which is challenged on a deep level. And so a beloved son isn't relieved of his lifestyle. He just learns how to move it in freedom in God, trusting in God, and somehow those needs are always met. Now, we all of us men want to get to a point in the order of nature. I find this still in me as long as I've lived this journey as a beloved son. Nature still inclines to like, oh, it's going to be great when life just kind of tapers off, you know, and I get to that plateau on the hill and everything kind of equalizes and the trials will be no more. My nature still like inclines that way, but, but that's not the reality that I know that I live in. Things become, become as it were intrinsically harder, but the beloved son in those intrinsically hard circumstances is able, if he yields to God, is able to be up to grow in greater freedom than even when all of his needs are met. And that's the paradox. That's the paradox of the Christian life. And, and that's also kind of going back to what we were saying earlier that um, that's why God the Father is the perfect Father. And we are imperfect fathers because sometimes uh, we're unwilling, we fear allowing our children to struggle yeah. or suffer or or to rely on God. We want to make it all okay for them, but we're not really doing them a favor. Yeah. And that's why let me let me close and I'll take the last word here sure. because I know we're past time. But this is why, Chuck, it is so 
vital that when Christian parents present their children for baptism, understand very clearly that while the identity of the beloved son, or we'd say the beloved daughter is imparted on the child, that's true. They have, and they've incorporated into Christ, that is true, but they've also incorporated that child into Christ's journey. And so part of what parents need to position themselves, and it's not easy, I understand this, is that they need to understand their child is surrendered to that journey of Christ too. They've, they've, they've brought the chi child into grace and glory, but they've also ushered the child in the path of Christ which is, 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 is shame and suffering. And so parents have got to see their children as following that journey, because if they're not willing to surrender that journey, the parents will never be free. And I see this so often in Christian parents. They haven't surrendered their children to truly be in Christ. They want kind of all the blessing and the grace that's going to get them to heaven someday. But it, if they realize this, it can actually be very frank. So I don't care where you're on the on the on the level of, of faith and trust and whatnot. Your kids are going to suffer. It's just the nature of the human condition. But boy, if a Christian parent can see that, well, yeah, but their suffering is in Christ and through Christ and in Christ, and they can make it through through Him, with Him, and in Him. Then I put them on the best path. But the, but unless they see that. And they're willing to yield their children to that. Parents never going to be free. They're going to always be worried about what's happening to their child, injustices against their child, how their child is, and you know what looks like it's unfair and unjust, and all the rest. Not to say they shouldn't uphold their child's rights and their their well being. They should, but they still have to surrender the child to that suffering, which is just the what's incumbent upon them just by living in the world. But when they surrender in Christ, and then it can they can really be free in that. So with that say, glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. All right. All right, Amen. Philip. All right, God be with you. All right, take care, Chuck. Until next time. God bless. If you enjoyed this video, please consider subscribing to the Men's Academy YouTube channel. You can also find us at themensacademy.org and donate there if you feel so moved. God bless.